Good morning and welcome to today's Excavation Safety Alliance Town Hall. My name is Whitney Price and I'm looking forward to today's discussion on what are the best ways to use vacuum excavation to prevent damage, create accurate maps, and as a part of SUE. I'd like to thank our ESA member companies for helping make these town halls possible. It's your support that makes our mission of saving lives through education and collaboration a reality. ESA town halls are an open forum for discussion for discussing concerns and presenting potential solutions to improve damage prevention and excavation safety. This town hall is meant to be a discussion and you're encouraged to ask questions and share solutions. If you do have a question, please type it into the chat or click the raise hand icon. Give us a few seconds and we will give you permission to unmute yourself. To unmute, simply click on the microphone icon in the top right hand corner of your screen. Please try to keep your comments brief to allow others time to interact and a recording of this town hall will be posted on ESA's YouTube channel. At the conclusion of the town hall, each of our panelists will highlight a moving forward step to ensure we stay focused on practical and impactful solutions. We will conclude today's call at 1130 AM Central. I'm pleased to have such a great panel with a wealth of knowledge and experience. So to get us started, I'd like our moderator and panel members to give a little background on themselves. Ron, I'll turn it over to you now. Very good. Thanks, Whitney. And yes, my name is Ron Peterson. I'm currently the executive director of NALCA, which is formerly known as the National Utility Locating Contractors Association. Uh, we represent utility locating uh, from all aspects, contract in-house and, and those who support the industry, including vacuum excavation. Uh, I'm also the current program administrator for the National Utility Contractors Association, NUCA, I do their uh, claims avoidance program. So I've been in the industry about 30 years. Um, happy to be here. Uh, VACX has been a big part of what I've done over the years in, in my uh, other work. So I'm happy to talk about that. So let's turn it over now to Bob Basquez, if you'll introduce and uh, give us your preliminary thoughts on VACX. Um, my uh, background, I'm the technical director of a, a nonprofit called Shared Geo, and we do a bunch of different kind of like, uh, I guess you'd call them fringe GIS application development um, projects, helping out um, different kind of entities. Right now we're working on a project which relates to the, the backside of things um, related to um, setting up a mechanism for sharing data for a one call system in the Minnesota. Um, the idea is that you'll actually have access to the feature data out in the field for all the underground utilities. So we're fairly well along on that. And then my day gig, um, the shared geo thing is the side stuff. Uh, the, my day gig is I, I work for the city of St. Paul and manage um, their engineering data sets. So basically everything in the right of way um, kind of comes under my purview there. So I manage the, the data and how the engineers get to use all of that kind of stuff. So that's a synopsis from my perspective on the um, lessons learned side of things. Um, on the back side, um, that's a newish aspect to me. I mean, we use it at the city. Um, we have a, a lot of that kind of stuff in the inner cities where we um, do a lot of our excavations, especially you know in the inner city um, kind of uh, setup. So I think this is going to be a good kind of overlap with the, the uh, my knowledge base with everybody else's. Excellent. Excellent, Bob. Thanks. Next, I'll move to uh, Kemp Garcia. Uh, Kemp, go ahead and uh, tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, good morning, Ron, and everybody out there. Um, I uh, started in the private locating world like 32 years ago, so it's been a, been a couple days. Um, uh, got into doing uh, VAC work about 12 years ago, but been around VAC trucks for uh, that 30 years. Uh, doing design locates and and whatnot, uh, doing Sue way back in the 90s. So um, I, I work for a company called uh, Linescape of Washington. Uh, I run the, we have a locating and a back truck division that I run. We also do directional drilling and an excavation division. Uh, so we got our hands in a, a bunch of different uh, pots to work with. Um, uh, so I've got crews out pothole and utilities on a, on a regular basis, um, again, for design and, and whatnot. But uh, um, also was a uh, past president of uh, NUCA of Washington, the uh, which is the National Utility Contractors Association. Um, just That was just recent uh, as of September. Um, but uh, we've, uh, um, I was telling Ron earlier that uh, we're in the revision of a dig law and um, I made sure that we had a, a contractor member 
um, at every subcommittee um, that we were out there. So that we worked well with the utilities in that process. So um, thanks for having me here today. All right, good to have you as well. Uh, next we'll move to Jerry Hoover. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jerry Hoover with Badger Daylighting, also known as Badger Infrastructure Solutions, as we transition our business to provide more solutions for our customers, uh, you know, working on a, on a name change there, but been in the vacuum excavation business for seven years uh, throughout North America. Uh, I work primarily with a group of our national accounts that, that covers that North American footprint. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here because I think it's wonderful that all of us are getting together to share practical ideas on how we can um, cause less damages to underground infrastructure and learn, learn from everyone on this call. So truly a great opportunity to get together. I think we all share a, a common goal to reduce utility damages and ensure that we keep our workers safe, the public safe, the environment safe and everything we do. So thank you for the opportunity. You bet and welcome. Um, next we'll go and last but certainly not least, Dustin Rhodes. Yeah, so um, I've been with Factor for nine years now. Uh, the last five years been involved in product management. Uh, so my current role is product manager for hydro excavation and industrial brands, uh, Truvac and Guzzler. Uh, my primary uh, goal is to increase awareness around safe digging uh, and how to use our equipment properly. Excellent. Excellent, Dustin. Well, welcome. So just as a reminder, Whitney said this earlier, but these town halls work best and are driven when you, the attendees, are asking the questions. I have some questions I'll throw out to start the thing, but this is your town hall. So please, please ask the questions. Um, I've got Mike on the other end watching because I'm not the greatest with these uh, these these formats. So Mike will be watching. We want to get those questions in and we want to take this the direction you want to take it. So uh, I'm going to start with the first softball I'm going to throw to the group. And uh, just if, if you will, uh, whoever wants to jump in first, uh, talk about how the adoption of vacuum excavation has really impacted damage prevention. If you want me to give somebody to start, I'm going to go back to Kemp. I'll make Kemp start us off, <laughs> but anybody else jump in as well. Yeah, um, it it has really been a game changer. I mean, I remember uh, probably 30 years ago, I was out locating some utilities and a guy wanted to use yellow iron to dig down two feet because the line was down three feet. And he said, man, every, every you know, the line we found it every time at, at three foot and we're going to use our, our yellow iron to dig down to it. And and uh, I was I was actually paid to sit there and make sure that he didn't didn't do that. Um, it was before really vac vac excavation was like a name brand across the board, but uh, it, it just a, a game changer um, when it comes to digging around utilities. Um, and I, I got obviously so many stories. Uh, one one was a different one when they um, their vac truck broke and uh which it happens right <laughs> right dustin um but when their back truck broke they pothole they potholed down 20 times and they didn't pothole the last time because with the back truck because it broke it was down for the day and uh they damaged a fiber line um because they were digging into it so it's it's a it is a game changer across the board um it's just a it's a safer method uh for you know, trying to protect utilities and and like Jerry said, it's also worker safety too. Yeah, so I'll add to that. Um, so there were 213,000 damaged utility events recorded last year. Um, that is down uh, compared to just uh, since 2019. It's half actually. It's 50 percent, but that's still way too many. Um, the increased popularity and awareness around vacuum excavation has led to most sewer cleaners. So a product primarily used to clean out storm drains, sewer drains, um, being equipped with vacuum ax capabilities um, because municipalities are seeing uh, the need for that additional support in their day, you know, day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and that's really showing uh, the awareness increase. Excellent. Uh, Jerry, you're on mute, buddy. 
<laughs> have to have to get used to this. So, uh, you know, we've seen a dramatic um, decrease in overall line strikes over the last 10 years. Uh, unfortunately, over 50% of all excavation damages are still caused by mechanical excavation and over 20% by hand excavation. Whereas on the vacuum excavation side, it's less than 1%. And really the only reason it's that high is because people may not be using the right water pressures, the right techniques properly trained or the right equipment. So I think it's in our, our interest to continue to uh, stress the uh, the cost savings, the uh, damage savings that can be brought on by using more vacuum excavation. It's, it's certainly the safest method of exposing underground utilities and ensuring that we don't disrupt uh, the vital infrastructure that we all rely on every day. And, and you know, that ranges from uh, things that go boom to things that interrupt your life, like uh, lack of internet, right? So it's, uh, uh, it's far reaching and uh, underground uh, utilities far more complex than they were even 10 years ago. So uh, really understanding that and, um, you know, utilizing in the 811 system and then and then using vacuum excavation to put visual verification on it before you mechanically excavate is hugely important. Yep, definitely agree. Um, before I forget and I see it, we had a question on, online uh, basically says they're doing water service inventory and they want to do they need to call and locate to daylight their own utilities. I'm going to give you a really broad answer first and that answer is going to be depends on where you are. Um, we have 50 different laws in, in the states, and um, there are some pretty different things. Uh, I, I love some of the comments that came back. When in doubt, call 811. I, I think you're always better to do that, um, to call 811 to be sure, but I would check with your own state law um, to, to see whether that's a possibility. And kind of to go along with one of the things that Jerry said and dealing with this, you know that there's a, a misconception that vacuum excavation will never hurt anything when used when used effectively and properly i would agree it's it's you're, you're not going to damage much when when done that way i however had got the uh the uh, unfortunate deal of watching a a crew crank up their their pressure on their water as high as they could possibly get it and and essentially cut through two uh poly PE uh, gas services. It can be done. Um, in some states at one point, uh, vacuum excavation was exempt from the one call law because the perception was you couldn't hurt anything. Well, you can, but if it's used effectively, it's very safe. And uh, I, I've heard the numbers that Jerry put out there. So um, see what else we have on questions here. But uh, I thought that was a good first question. Don't see anything. Um, Let's see, here's another question we have here. Um, do you ever see a day when 811 will be replaced by Sioux and digital mapping? Um, pretty good question. Uh, anybody on our panel want to take that one on? Yeah, I can I can jump in on that one. I'm actually right now building that type of system right now as a kind of a prototype for the state of Minnesota. So we've got a mechanism that we can actually push out the digital data related to uh, the different kinds of features that are underground. The bigger deal that we're kind of coming across is making sure that we're relaying the fact that the data is not entirely, you know, 100% accurate. We're trying, we're wrestling with what is going to be good enough. Um, it's kind of coming down to what type it is, you know, a high pressure gas line versus a fiber line is, you know, there's two different danger aspects there, that kind of thing. Um, but we're trying to come up with a, a good happy medium of how that's going to work in um, describing and displaying the information. But the um, bigger deal in that is this whole pre-design kind of uh, going out and trying to figure out where things are and being able to get at the actual features to be able to pull them into your engineering software. So we're working on the engineering request tickets right now, and it fits right into that question. So um, there's not really anybody across the country that's doing it uh, quite at this level where we're going across the whole state. Um, there's a couple of uh, groups around the country that I know in, Cal in Colorado, they're doing it on a project basis. So they're, they're doing it from the state perspective. But uh, we're attempting to do this for the whole state and I'm um, tying it right into the 811 um, ticketing system. So it's coming. Very good. Thank you, Bob. Uh, other other thoughts from our panelists? 
Yeah, Bob, you bring yeah. up some great points. I think, you know, when you talk about the accuracy of the data, you know, having some standardization on that and understanding, there's just so much infrastructure. I see that, you know, it will take quite a bit of time before uh, all of that data catches up with, uh, you know, what we can find through the 811 system and visual verification. So uh, it's it's probably a long ways off, but I think we're all working towards that goal of, of making sure that there's accurate data on everything that's found out there. Yeah, well, kind of a, a follow on to my follow on there to your uh, statements there. One piece of the equation that we're working on is actually being able to upload data from the field. So if you've got equipment out in the field that actually can um, geolocate the information like GPS enabled on, on the back trucks, where you can actually um, GPS the uh, particular features underground after they're exposed, the system that we're building will be able to accept that data and push it back up into the ticketing system. And we're going to build a system where that stuff will be recorded so that when the next ticketing system maybe comes down the uh, road a little bit, you'll have that information available um, when you go and uh, make your ticket request. Awesome. Awesome. Excellent points. Anybody else want to jump in on that? All right. Uh, we have a follow up question to that. And that follow up question is from my good friend Brenda out in uh, Pennsylvania. And she asked if we feel that va uh, 811 should be called when using vacuum excavation. And if so, why? So hop on. <laughs> Can I jump in on that one? Absolutely. So um, the way I, I we, we try to call in 811 um, when we know we're going to be out there um, and, and doing work, mostly if we're in the potholing process and we're kind of manning the show. Um, but when we're out, when we get called in by a contractor to do hydro excavation, um, the contractors, and, we, and let me step back in Washington State, we don't have any kind of piggyback law on 811. So we, we can't just say, because the contractor is digging and all of a sudden, or he calls and hills locates and all of a sudden he has a bunch of lines on the ground that he needs to like be careful and doesn't and don't dig them up with a, a an excavator. So he calls in a hydro excavator and he, if I sat there and said, let me wait on it, I got to call in my locates and wait, you know, the two business days, it's it's a it's going to slow down the process of him doing his work uh, or that excavating company. So we 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 try to get the calls in. But also, we're out there digging with, um, uh, uh, you know, a hydro excavator. That's as we've all discussed and heard from Jerry that it's less than one percent of the time, or it was, maybe it was Dustin, um, less than one percent of the time a damage occurs. So there's times when we don't have one call, you know, or eight one one called in for those reasons. And that, I think that's pretty much across the across the board um, with all, all hydro excavators. Oh. Uh I'll give you another question and Mike if I've missed any questions along the way feel free to jump in uh, the next question I see is do you find that additional uh, encroachment permits uh, with traffic plans etc serves a deterrent as a deterrent for uh, project owners to want vacuum excavation in advance of, of uh, con construction hopefully I didn't mess that up too bad <laughs> in other words this permitting uh, in, in any way determined that you a deterrent you see uh, for vacuum excavation? I'll, I'll jump in. I think one of the bigger concerns is that, you know, a lot of the need for vacuum excavation seems to be determined last minute. Uh, it, it, it's one of those, oh boy, we better, uh, we better check something out here before we go any further. And as a result, that puts a bit of a strain on uh, getting tickets called in. You know, we operate in 50 states and throughout all the Canadian provinces and, and the laws vary quite dramatically. Um, so, you know, advanced planning is probably the most important thing to make sure that those tickets can be uh, can be entered into the system. Um, you know, wide variety of what the different states require, but, but certainly, you know, traffic control permitting takes a considerable amount of time. And biggest thing there is ensuring worker safety, making sure that, you know, when we when we show up on the site to do the vacuum excavation, that people are properly protected and in a position to be able to work safely. Okay, very good. Um, I'm going to move to... I do, have a, yeah. I do have a question from the chat. Um, what safety innovations is the industry looking at to make the truck safer and push the industry forward? So I can kind of speak to that a little bit. Um, so 
our product and Jerry or uh, yeah, Jerry's product also has an e-stop, right? So anybody can walk up and hit that and it stops the truck and puts it in a safe condition, right? So uh, stops water, reduces vacuum, turns it to an idle. Um, there's also uh, projects underway uh, with nozzle companies to make them safer so that you don't accidentally overpressure and cut those polypropylene tubing. Um, our truck also has a system where you can electronically limit uh, the water pressure. So the operator can keep raising it and uh, it won't go above that predetermined limit. Uh, so then again, you won't cut through those. Um, a lot of it's just awareness with the operator, right? Getting a properly trained operator is the safest thing you can do. Yeah, you, it's a great point on the operator training, Dustin. Um, there's certainly a lot of uh, different safety elements that we've incorporated into our trucks over the years, uh, you know, boom height limiters, things of that nature that uh, protect against raising the boom too high and perhaps coming in contact or close proximity to energized power lines, the e-stops that you mentioned, whip checks on the uh, on the dig wands, uh, you know, various, various elements like that, um, you know, down to uh, uh, geo tracking and and lytics camera systems to you know keep drivers safe and to help coach them in terms of their driving habits and it's, you know a lot of time is spent out on the roads out there so we want to make sure that they arrive safe and and depart safe as well so um, knowing the uh, knowing the various infrastructure that you're digging around and have you know testing the equipment and the safe water pressures is uh, is a huge factor right um, you know it was mentioned before digging at that high water pressure can cause an awful lot of damage you saw it yourself ron um, you, know, you think about how they cut granite countertops it's with a it's with a water jet cnc machine you could do a lot of damage with water at the wrong pressure so those are all very important factors yeah, i would also mention that uh if anyone's listening and once uh, some best practices. The Gas Technology Institute, which is an uh, independent third party, uh, has a list of best practices uh, on their website. Great tool to utilize uh, if you're going to be hydro excavating. Yep, agree. I I'll add, and maybe this shows my age a little bit, and Jerry said a little bit about booms and height limiters. I think the, the use of, of, of booms, period, uh, even on some of the smaller units now has helped. I can remember my guys wrestling long lengths of hoses and, you know, we had all kinds of injuries related to, you know, you've got these vac units that are pushing a lot of pressure and these guys are fighting hoses all day. Well, those, those booms had, had made a, a significant difference in, in when I was doing it. So, um, love the innovation. Had a, had a question run through that was pretty much answered by the chat. I would imagine you, you guys will probably have the same answer that I feel is the difficulty of finding a CDL driver that will get out of the truck and work period. Maybe it's just finding a CDL driver to hire or, or anybody to hire at this point, but you're welcome to comment on that if, if you'd like as well. I would imagine it's tough all over. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, last uh, couple of years we've uh, we do dozer days here at Nuka of Washington, and uh, we put on a uh, uh, career day for um, kids coming out of out of high school that are maybe not going to college. And one thing that I stress to them is go get your CDL. Once you have your CDL, um, you you will always be working um, one way or another. So go get your CDL. And and then the question came up: Well, how much does that cost? And how much time does it take? And I'm like, it takes, you know, three to six weeks, depending on what kind of classes you take and six thousand dollars. And they're like, oh, my gosh, that's expensive. And I'm like, what's one what's one semester of college cost? There was your answer. I mean, I mean, come on, get a hey, go get a CDL. You'll always be working. So. That's a great point, Kemp. You know, it's uh, the last stat I saw, there was a nationwide shortage of CDL drivers that was over two hundred thousand. Uh, that's a that's a very big number, and we all know that hydrovac work is physically demanding. It's done in uh, fairly inclement weather conditions from time to time. So, you know, we've implemented a program to take non-CDL operators and assist them in the process of getting their CDL. And and really, it it comes down to providing a uh, a, a great work environment where people feel appreciated and 
you know, referrals, things of that nature certainly help on that. But I think that, you know, when I talk to various people and throughout the construction industry, it's a common challenge for all of us. So, um, you know, I, I like I like the idea you brought up, Kemp, given the given the thought of getting that CDL early in life and you'll never be without work. So it's a great point. Excellent, excellent. Before I forget, there was a question about putting up the uh, the link to the GTI and that uh, that best practice. And one of our uh, our uh, uh, attendees has already put that up. So if you don't have the chat up and you're interested in that, you can go to the chat link and you will find the link to the GTI. So thanks to our uh, our folks for bringing that up. Um, so let's see. Um, are you seeing anything specific to regulations that are either endorsing or practices that are endorsing or requiring the use of VACX on, on projects? Um, I, I will say I haven't seen that, but we'll throw that to the panelists to say um, what you think or what you've seen as far as any kind of regulatory requirements or compliance. I, I can jump in on that. Um, Sorry, I'll, I'll let you go, Dustin. I, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. What I was going to say, uh, there's a great website uh, and app uh, by the National Excavator Initiative. Uh, it's called Safe Excavator. If you go to the Google Play Store or the Apple uh, Store, um, it has every regulation by state. Uh, explains what the tolerance zones are for each state because that does differentiate um, state to state. Uh, currently, there's 49 states that have, or 42 states, sorry, 42 states that have special language around hand digging or soft excavation within the tolerance zone. Um, eight states uh, do not even have special language around that. Um, so is it getting better? Yes. Is there room for improvement? Yes. I just to add a little more in the Canadian market, which is much more developed from a Hydrovac standpoint in the province of Ontario, for example, Hydrovac is mandated in certain areas. So you don't see uh, many excavators on the back of trucks rolling around out there. You see more Hydrovac units. So uh, I, I think that, you know, as um, as the safety uh, is recognized of Hydrovac versus other excavation methods, uh, you're likely to see more of it, and unfortunately, it's the it's the major damages that kind of force that to the forefront. Um, but it'd be nice to see some consistency in the laws out there. I think that would be helpful because you know many of our customers and contractors work state to state, and knowing that state's law is extremely important for them. I can relate from the municipal side too, from the at least from the city of St. Paul, that there are um, contracting elements um, in certain areas where they require back trucks, you know, excavations versus out in uh, other areas where it's a little bit more freeform. But th there's actual contract language in there, you know, related to that. So, excellent. Looking to the right here, I'm seeing more questions, which is awesome. Uh, may word this question slightly differently. Um, how in tune uh, are the VAC pro providers to the the test pit requirements when you're talking about SU subsurface utility engineering nearing level A? Um, I, I would assume you guys are very in tune to that, but you can talk about, if you would, the VACX and um, subsurface utility engineering. Anybody want that? <laughs> sure, I, I can certainly jump in there. Um, look, SU Level A requires a visual verification, which uh, which opens the the door and the opportunity for uh, Hydrovac is certainly the safest way to accomplish that. I think also uh, the capture of the data once you're in there and understanding what what's been found, uh, what's the condition of the uh, utilities that have been found, extremely important. There's no time better to capture that information than after you've exposed it. Um, jumping back to the to the previous question, there are many uh, large contractors out there that are absolutely mandating visual verification 
before mechanical excavation. So uh, you're seeing, you know, private industry get involved there as well. In addition to what Bob mentioned with the uh, municipalities, there are a number of municipalities that are moving towards that mandate of hydro. Excellent, excellent. And before I forget, um, going back to Dustin with a safe excavator, uh, there have been a number of people that have put on the chat access to that. I will tell you, I use Safe Excavator in my training around the country as a starting point. Um, I, I always, and within Safe Excavator, it'll give you a link to the specific laws. So I'll look at what they've got. Then I get, take that link and I can go back and make sure everything's up to date and do it. But it's a great app for those that move in multiple states and it's free. It's free download. So um, appreciate those folks that put that out. Um, Let's see, what else do we have here? Got a lot, a lot to go with. Um, you want to talk about um, cost effectiveness, you know, use of what somebody just called traditional excavation versus VACX. Um, how is it, how do you guys perceive it as cost effective, um, savings wise? Is it more expensive? You know, just your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, um, up front, um, hydro excavation looks more expensive because it's the equipment's expensive, the uh, disposal, the travel. It's it's all it's all more it's, it, it becomes more expensive up up front. But all it takes is damage in one utility, and um, as in Jerry said, you know things don't you know some things don't go boom. Uh, but I when I teach a, a dig safe class here, um, I say you know what. It, it may not go boom, but when when the internet goes down in my house, it goes boom because we, everybody's <laughs> streaming TV now. And if my girls can't watch watch you know whatever television show, High School Musical or whatnot, it's going boom. So up front, yeah, it's more expensive. In the end, it's it's less expensive because you don't have downtime, you don't have damages, you don't have reporting, everything that goes with it. Um, so, uh, but. I, I it's it, like I said in the end it's it's less expensive. Um, now if you have you're in an open field and there's no utilities around, obviously it's going to be it's going to be cheaper to 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 you know just use a traditional excavator. But once you have any utilities in the area, it's it's a less expensive model. You brought yeah, I was gonna... some great. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dustin. Sorry, uh, I was going to add. So uh, when you talk about the cost, so just uh, the estimated cost by CGA, the Common Ground Alliance, uh, for last year was over $30 billion as an economic impact by damaged utilities. Yeah, so I, I'm with you, Kemp, where we say it, it may cost a little more up front, but what is the value of a human life when things do go boom, right? On the other side of that, when you talk about like internet, um, so imagine... Uh, you strike utility and a warehouse isn't able to operate because it has no power, right? Uh, what's the cost of that? Just not only as lost profit, but then to get that warehouse back to whole. So now they may have to work overtime. Uh, you know, the impact to the people in general is high. Yep. Fantastic points. And we all know that if there's a utility line strike on a project, what's the first thing that happens? work stops. So what's the cost of that? You know, if you've got a, a work stoppage for a few days or a few weeks based on the severity of the line strike, all of those costs continue to mount and put the project further behind. Uh, the cost of workers' comp claims for hand dig crews, things of that nature should be factored in. But all of those things really make HydroVac um, quite a bargain in the long run when you look at what can potentially go wrong and what the cost can be to the contractor and to the public based on those line strikes. Yep, I, I agree. And, you know, I, I provided years ago some VAC service and private line locating, not too different from what uh, Kemp does, I think, on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, I, I <laughs> with requirements of, of hand digging in the tolerance zone, I would take that VAC unit any day of the week over having guys out there digging with a shovel. We have a lot of shovel damages out there that, like I said, may not necessarily go boom, but, uh, you know, to, to your points, when when 
something gets hit, the work stops. And I, I often tell the people that I'm training in the construction world, the cost of a damage isn't if you're wrong, isn't what you pay. That's not just the cost of your damage. And maybe you're not at fault, but all that downtime, all that, the real cost of the damage is the overall piece, the delays, the additional maybe material required, bringing people back. Um, even if you didn't cause the damage or you weren't the liable party, using the vacuum excavation properly, you know, in that tolerance zone is, is a big deal. You know, the other thing we used it for was, uh, you know, we did a lot of slot trenching back in the day to find that that utility that, you know, supposedly couldn't be found. You know, hey, we've got a fiber out here with no uh, no tracer on it. You know, what are we going to do? Well, we'd slot trench and we'd find it. So there are a lot of, of efficiencies, I think, to, to VACX that, that really uh, um, move us in the right direction, I would say, and keep us cost effective. Um, so what are you guys seeing as far as potential evolution of VACX, um, the tech, technological advances we've had to date, and where do you see it going? Well, I'd like to, uh, I guess, bring up, um, we, we've, we, I've got involved with uh, um, a company, Bernstein, Inter Bernstein International Inframarker, uh, to use um, uh, markers to put in the ground when we do vac excavation um so the, and then it goes into the cloud to be able to to help that i mean back in the day there was the 3m marker balls and whatnot but um i've been involved with with them to try to help out so when we pothole that we have a known location because i don't know how many projects i've sent the same vac or a vac truck out to the same job to pothole the same line multiple times um uh so i uh, you know those those that's a inframarker is a, a nice one to be able to utilize um uh with that process um yeah dustin I got, I, or, oh, okay go ahead bob i'm sorry oh i was just gonna say i got a little follow-up line on that the project that we're working on with this digital data um distribution model eventually will go into the 3d side of things too so um with the uh, notion that the field equipment is getting cheaper and cheaper, for example, you could literally right now tape an iPhone onto the end of your boom and do a LIDAR scan of the pit after you've got it excavated and you have a 3D model for future use. Very similar to what you're just describing on trying to figure out how to record stuff out in the field. Um, those kinds of uh, data captures will be supportable in the future uh, for building a 3D model or you know, semi-digital twin of the underground infrastructure. No, that's interesting because I, oddly enough, I have a an iPad Pro based um, LiDAR app that is amazing. The quality of, of data you get from that from from just my iPad going back, you know, 10 years when they were setting up these these stations and it was, you know, I don't I, I remember numbers like a quarter million dollars to go out and do this or that. I've got my three thousand dollar, which is excessive uh, iPad Pro Plus that'll do all that for nothing. So uh, it's cool where technology's going. Uh, Dustin, Jerry, got anything on the uh, the evolution of uh, VAC technology? Yeah, so I'll just say that nozzle companies are getting better and better. Um, vacuums getting higher, trucks getting more efficient. Uh, I think the future is going to be air or an air and water combination. Um, it's going to be interesting over the next few years. Obviously, telematics are going to play a lot into it. Uh, the three-dimensional mapping, uh, like Bob brought up, um, the more we map, the better we're going to get, right? I, I, I just see it expanding. Yeah, it's a constant evolutionary process. I'm sure you'd agree, Dustin. You know, it's, there's always uh, always looking for new ways to innovate, make the equipment more efficient, safer. Um, I, I, I do agree with, you know, air, air is a company world, uh, especially if you in you know, fenced operations, you know, compressor stations, things of that nature, where they don't really want you using water or hauling the spoils off site. So uh, a lot of research and development in those areas. Um, there's a question there about uh accuracy of the data that you can capture from the field. Um, in the case of an iPhone, for example, I've done quite a bit of testing um, on my own on that, and the model that it returns it, itself from end to end is very accurate. 
with it in many cases sub centimeter and you don't really get into a lot of error until you're um, actually moving maybe you know past 100 foot so if you go and walk a trench that's 50 feet long on both sides the models that come back are very very accurate the tricky part with the uh, stuff that's out there right now is positioning that model in the real world you know relating it to actual coordinates um Having said that, there are tools that you can clip onto the iPhone in, in that particular instance that are GNS enabled, so it's survey accuracy. So you're in the sub centimeter and that's well within limits for, you know, hand digging and all that kind of stuff, you know, down the line. So if we can figure out a mechanism to pull all of this information together into a service that people can access when they go and do a ticket call and then be able to interpret it in the field, you know, that's that's where we're headed right now. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I've I've been experimenting with some technology out there. You know, the the locate world now has gone gone into the uh, the RTK world with their their receivers, and um, I'm amazed at some of the stuff that can come out of that with with some mapping capabilities, which is not my forte. I'm you know I'm <laughs> I'm a dinosaur. You know, give me the paper maps, not really, but um, but it's it's really amazing to see what what's coming with that and and. Uh, the use of the the iPhones and some of this as well for data collection, where something else is collecting an RTK, and that's way above my uh, my pay grade. Um, this this is going to. We've got a couple of questions in here as well, but um, I was about to ask this question anyway. Air versus water. Um, what do you guys see? I, and I'll tell you from my experience, uh, I used both in my world. Um, Early on, we didn't have the option of air, so we uh, made our own, like you said, compressors and wands and did what we did. Um, but uh, man, it was tough getting through heavy clays and caliche with, without water. Yeah, air was tough, but I'll let you guys weigh in on how you use it and what you do and goods, bads, all that. I think it's operator preference. Um, there's obviously pros and cons to each of them. Um, they each have their place obviously like in the southeast where it's sandy air is awesome uh state of florida uh has a preference uh, for air near uh, roadways uh perfect for that application you're right in clay it has some challenges uh, i think that technology is going to advance and we're going to see air catch up with water in the long run okay camp yeah, my thought is um, if you're potholing and uh, and I've, I saw a question about backfill also, um, and if you're potholing and putting that same material um, back into the hole, um, you just don't you're not going to get the compaction to it. And in fact, a lot of cities um, require um, imp import of material for for that reason. Um, I see potholes that are out there that are we're used with air and I see the the a failure on the at the surface because of it so um if you're going to use air you just you still need to import material um obviously when you're if you're using hydro uh um and that's my opinion but uh if you're you're going to be doing hydro excavation um you're putting adding water to it so it's it's you're going to be important anyway but um my my worry is if you're doing the sue process of it it's also about the backfill of it to restore the surface so it's it's properly you know put together and i don't necessarily see if, if people are going to reuse the material i don't see that being an option because you're actuating that soil and, and fluffing it up yeah all all great points on air versus water i think you know a lot of what uh, governs that for us and we do both is the you know the, the type of facility we're in if if water can be used uh, certainly soil conditions have a big factor on it frozen ground conditions you can forget about air uh, that's just not a possibility for you so I think there's going to be a place for both long term um, water is certainly still a more efficient way to go uh, I I think you know Dustin you're right airs airs quickly catching up in a lot of in a lot of ways, but um, there'll, there'll be a place for both long term. And I, I think the efficiency of water is going to get better too over time. So, um, you know, as we look forward today, uh, all of our products use water in some sort. And um, at some point, that natural resources become limited or we're going to be limited on the amount that we can use. So I think we're going to be forced to get more efficient. 
all good points. Excellent points. Um, have a, a question over here about. Uh, I guess it's essentially providing data back to operators and are you having finding them ability to accept finding them willing to accept your GPS coordinates? Evidently in California, a lot of the owner operators um, are uh, they don't want to accept third party coordinates. So you've gone to the trouble to vac it and maybe this is a Bob question. Uh, you taking these coordinates. Uh, and since you're city of St. Paul, maybe you, you've got both sides of this thing. What do you think? Well, I can start out with that one. We're in the project that we're working on for, you know, sharing the digital information for the ticketing. Um, this is it. This is one of those conundrums. Um, we're trying to figure out, first of all, who owns it, because, you know, you're not really looking at <laughs> nobody has their name on their stuff, you know, <laughs> out in the field. So that's the first hurdle. The second hurdle is um, we're trying to present the information in a way that um, indicates there's very, very uh, a split that we're going to um, be using is if you see a solid line, that particular feature is going to be um, located very accurately, like, you know, grade A, ASC, you know, that kind of thing. Most of the information that you're going to see is dashed and that that is going to indicate that, you know, we know there's something there. It's in about this location and we're still working on trying to style the information so that it's obvious to the um, viewer what they're looking at and what kind of accuracy they think you know that the data is in but when you're passing the information back upstream those are um, policy things that we're still working out um, some of it may have to do with abandoned and or um, information that we don't know who owns it so how do we push that stuff back up into the system do we even keep it you know that that wasn't even a part of the project when we first started so they're all still kind of some somewhat questions up in the air, but they have been voiced and um, there are people uh, smarter than me working on how that's going to be solved. Any other thoughts on that as we move? Excellent. Um, Bob, I think I'm, I'm going to pick on you a little bit here. Um, I want to talk about uh, uh, some stuff that I know is somewhat near and you, near and dear to you regarding uh, collection of data, getting data to the field, or taking data out of the field, getting it to you. If you, you want to comment on any of that, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so the, the system that we're building right now, we're concentrating on engineering tickets. So we've got an engineering ticket, a locate ticket, and an excavation ticket. Those are kind of like the three main baskets that we're working towards. And right now we're concentrating on the engineering side. And my background is trying to figure out I know what what it entails for an engineering uh, group or company to go out there and try and find this information before they even actually go out and start and dig in a hole. So they have to go out and figure out who owns what, what stuff might be out there in the field, and then actually go in, uh, behind the scenes and contact each one of those um, facility operators or owners for their information. What we're trying to do with the system that we're putting together is make that stuff very, very easy. So as part of the ticket, you're actually gonna have a download option um, for the feature information to pull it into your engineering software. So we already have that um, working and we're working with different kinds of formats that will be available. Um, another piece related to some other conversations that have been going on here a little earlier in the conversation, um, we are actually gonna be setting these um, this output or report that um, come back, comes back with the feature information. Uh, it'll work in an offline mode. So the idea is the features are actually generated and um, inserted into the HTML along with the background tiling. So you'll be able to use the ticket, navigate on the map out in the field without even having an internet connection. So that relates to some other comments that were going on um, earlier in the conversation. So, you know, in, in general, that's the attack that we're, uh, or attack that we're taking right now for, um, you know, putting things together. And uh, we're well along with having our prototype up and running. And we're kind of on the tail end of the engineering side and just getting ready to start working on the locate side. So that would be where it would really play into this whole back side of things. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, if any of you three want to continue commenting on any of that, let me know. Otherwise, um, probably got time for maybe one more question. I'll let you guys do a wrap up after that. Um, Ron, you have uh, a question from Brenda. How do back truck practitioners deal with abandoned lines you find? I know you briefly mentioned abandoned lines. Yeah, yeah, and I just saw that pop up. Thank you for that. Uh, Mike, um, so uh, Jerry and Kemp, you guys are 
probably at the forefront of out actually finding lines. What do you guys think? What do you do? I know from my perspective, it depended on my client who I was doing the work for, um, you know, and, and what they wanted out of that. But uh, I'll, I'll leave to you guys. I would say from our standpoint, we find it and uh, the company that hired us to find whatever that's uh, that's up to their, uh, them to make a determination on what happens after that. Uh, you know, oftentimes you're not even aware if it is abandoned or not when you're simply hydrovacking that line. So uh, we provide the information, we provide the visibility to the customer and they make the determination on what happens from there. It was an essay. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, that when I've been in the field and they discover a line that nobody knows about, they always assume it's alive, right? So that's the first assumption. You always assume it's alive until somebody tells you differently. That's the best way to approach those. Agree. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And uh, I, I, I go um, during the um, Sioux process, if we're out potholing um, for design, um, and we run across utilities that we don't know that, that weren't located and we don't know what they are. Um, we document it, put it on the put it on our plan accordingly so that we can. Uh, uh, so when that, you know, the contractor job goes out to bid, um, it, they they know it's there um, so that they don't all of a sudden have a what's happening here kind of thing. They'll know it's there because it's going to be in the plans. We may because we just did a, a an individual pothole or a window. Um, we don't know exactly where it's running the whole time um, and it wasn't located, um, but we we will, you know, at that point in time, call in back to to locates to find out if there was something that was mismarked or or whatnot. Not necessarily answering the abandoned situation, but we don't know if, if it's abandoned or if it's just a, a mismarked line, too. So we it's documented for the future. So recently I was out in Pennsylvania and was talking to some fiber guys and in Pennsylvania, they're using abandoned gas line and blowing in fiber and i was like isn't that putting you like in a what could happen situation because you discover this cast iron gas line from the 50s and you're like oh that's abandoned right like and then you dig into it and there's actually fiber inside so i think it's really important that we mark everything that we find yep couldn't agree more and we see that you know uh, the underground space is more and more congested. You do see a lot more people trying to utilize those abandoned lines as they come out for that. But again, that goes back to our, our, our guys getting those things marked out. But yeah, absolutely. I treat everything as live. Uh, I've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, so I'm going to go around the room here and uh, have you give us some final thoughts, wrap ups where we're going from here. Since I went alphabetically the first time, we're going to reverse it. Dustin, you're up. <laughs> Sure. Uh, so I, three things. Um, vacuum excavation is the safest method, no matter what you're using, right? Whether it's air or water, I would say always call 811 and know your legislation. Excellent. Excellent. Jerry, over to you. All fantastic points, Dustin. Couldn't agree more with, with uh, any of those. So I, I would say, look, um, it's a cost effective method. It will keep your company out of trouble and keep you off the evening news, uh, which I think is one of those costs that uh, nobody thinks about, but can be the most damaging. Uh, if you if you have a line strike, uh, you don't want to be in the public eye, right? So um, extremely cost effective. It will keep your projects on schedule. It will keep you under budget, and it is absolutely the safest way to go. We appreciate the opportunity to share and learn from uh, uh, each other on this. And also uh, the questions that were asked were fantastic. So thank you. Kemp, you're up next. Yeah, um, same thing. And um, yeah, Jerry, that's that's exactly that. We were directional drilling at a, an apartment complex and, and none of the gas laterals were located. Um, and we, we stopped process there and got them relocated and then potholed them, you know, in the, the, we would have been in front of 500 apartment units. And if we would have hit one of those gas lines, we would have been all over the evening news and it wouldn't have been our fault um, because we, in theory, didn't, we were, they weren't located. So um, that's, you're absolutely right about the, get, once you get your, your truck goes on the evening news, you're at, at, at a loss. So, um, but with that, I, I mean, we've talked about Sue. I, I just can't 
push that enough um, that it really needs to be um, across the board more and more uh, because it, you municipalities or even on the private world, um, it's, it's going to reduce the costs. It's going to not be any kind of, you know, unknowns for the future of the project. We got to, we, we just got to uh, get more of that out there um, so that it doesn't slow down projects. It actually, jobs will come in under bid. Uh, we'll get more knowledge to the, when the bidding process occurs. So the more we can have that done, uh, the better. And I know, you know, that's Bob, you that's what you're working on there. So, and I've got a few cities around me that that's what they, they're pushing nowadays because they know, they realize that that's where they're saving great, you know, their saving dollars will be at, even though it's more expensive up front. And last but not least, Bob. <laughs> well, I like going on the end because all I got to do is just say ditto. <laughs> exactly. um, I would I would really stress the you know as everybody's already indicated that there's a lot of opportunity here on the digital data side of things and wherever the group thinks it's going in the future uh, the sensors are getting smaller and cheaper to mount on field equipment and being able to record so that that is just going to get easier and cheaper down the line here and the more of these kinds of sensors that are out in these field equipment I mean you're you're going to get to the point here where you're probably going to be able to clip a, a, a sensor onto a shovel I'm 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 not even exaggerating <laughs> at some point and that information the more that uh, of that stuff that we can pull back up into the system and um, record and use for the next guy that's going to um, be what uh, helps everything and and uh, uh, affects everything that everybody's already said. Excellent. Great points by all. And I'll just add my two cents that, uh, you know, vacuum ex excavation is a hugely important part of what we do, whether it's uh, in the construction side, the excavation side, and it's, and also in the planning side. Man, we get this to where it should be. You know, you have great plans, accurate uh, plans, you have better, safer excavation. And along with all that, to Bob's points, getting that data out, getting things better, moving in the right direction. I think we're 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 uh, we're on the cusp. It's a great age to be doing this and improving things. I don't know that we'll ever get rid of 811, but we can sure make it a lot more effective. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Mike and Whitney uh, for any final comments, thoughts, questions. Uh, appreciate the, the panel. You guys are awesome. And back to you, Whitney. All right. Well, thanks, Ron. Lots of really good discussion today. I enjoyed it. And with that said, I would like to genuinely thank all of you for joining. And a big thank you to our moderator and panelists for sharing their expertise. Please take a moment now to fill out a brief survey that Levi will post in the chat so we can continue to improve these discussions and address topics that are important to you. Please note there is an additional field if you'd like to provide your mailing address to receive a complimentary 2023 excavation safety guide. A blog post about the town hall will be posted on excavationsafetyalliance.com where you can register for future town halls. Our next town hall will be January 11th discussing how can we address safety concerns and job delays related to abandoned lines. As a reminder, the Global Excavation Safety Conference is headed to New Orleans next March and first time attendees can still register for just 811. Again, thank you all for joining and we'll see you all next year. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Stay safe.